Okay, turn in your Bible to the book of Job if you want to, if you will. And let's see what the Lord has to say today. I'm going to preach to you on an unusual subject. I don't understand. I don't understand. But it could go on and say, but I do understand. But I'm going to show you why I don't understand. Or I don't understand. Charles Sand, he must, he must look over my shoulder and see what I'm preparing. Because <laughs> it seems like he preaches almost what I'm going to preach. But it's not altogether what I'm going to preach. How many heard him this morning? Well, nobody, one or two heard him. He preached on acquiring wisdom. Well, I'm going to talk to you about getting a hold of wisdom and understanding. If you'd like to stand as we read at least the first part of my scripture today, in the book of Job, chapter number 28 and verse number 12. Where, but where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? You know where it's at. Man knoweth not the price thereof, neither is it found in the land of the living. You don't know how much it cost. It's not found in the land of the living. What about that? The depths saith it is not in me. The ocean says it's not in me. The sea says it's not it with me. So the deep waters say, hey, wisdom's not found in me and understanding's not found in me. It cannot be gotten for gold, neither shall silver be weighed for the price thereof. It cannot be valued with the gold of Ophir and with the precious onyx and sapphire stone. Jump down to verse 20. Whence then cometh wisdom and where is the place of understanding? Seeing it is hid from the eyes of all living. Wow. He says in chapter number 28 and 28, well, where does wisdom come from? How do you get wisdom? Well, he tells us right there in chapter 28 of the book of Job and verse 28. That's easy to remember, isn't it? Job 28, 28. And the man he saith, behold, the fear of the Lord. That is wisdom and to depart from evil that is understanding what about that Father in heaven it's a blessing to be in the house of God it's a blessing to have a copy of your divine word we thank you for the privilege just to magnify your name and to preach the word of God give liberty give unction Father we touch, need that touch today without you we can't do anything we're a sounding brass a tinkling cymbal but we pray for the touch of God and the blessings of God reach out to every soul and Give them understanding today. May they be touched and moved by the power of God. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' holy and righteous name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, where did wisdom come from anyway? Well, we know it comes from the word of God, don't we? That is so simple as you think about it. The Bible said in Psalm 111, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, a good understanding of have all they that do his commandments. If you want a good understanding, keep the word of God. Okay, let's read some more scripture from the word of God and see what he says. In the book of Psalms 119, 119 verse 105, the Bible said, Thy word is a lamp to my feet. It's a lamp to my feet. It's a, a light into my path. The word of God, that's the word of God. It shines upon where we stand. It shows us where we're at. And then it shows us where we're going. You know, that's what the world don't have. They don't have that light on their feet. They don't know where they're standing at. They're standing on slippery ground. They're standing on ground that's going to go down with them. And they can't see where they're going. They better see because at the end of that journey for them is hell. And so they need to wake up. Again, the Bible says in the book of Psalms and verse number uh, one, well, that's 119, verse 98. Through the through thy word, thy commandments has made me wiser than my enemies. Through the word of God, we're made wiser than enemies. Yeah. So if you want to understand it, if you want the wisdom, then hey, just get the word of God and begin to read. Psalm 119, verse 99. I have more understanding than all the teachers. I have more understanding than all my teachers. How many has ever went through school? Let's see your hand. Half of you hadn't gone to school. <laughs> Well, all my teachers, I had some pretty smart teachers, you know. I, I went to Bible Institute, went to uh, college, and had some pretty smart folk, you know. But the Bible said I'm wiser than all my teachers through 
The Word of God, through the Word of God. That's where you get wisdom. That's where you get understanding through the Word of God. And so if you never pick up the Bible, hey, you don't have any wisdom. You don't have any understanding, do you? Psalm 119, verse 100, I understand more than the ancient. I understand more than the ancient, the old people, because I keep thy precepts through the Word of God, and keeping the Word of God, I'm wiser than the old people. You've seen a lot of dumb old people, haven't you? You think because um, they're old, they ought to have a lot of wisdom, a lot of understanding, but hey, some of them's as dumb as a rock. One old man said, I ain't going to die. I'm not going to die. If he wasn't going to die, he wasn't ready to die. And you know what? It wasn't long after that he kicked the bucket. And so, hey, he was very dumb. The Bible said in Psalm 119, verse 104, through thy precepts I get understanding. I get understanding through thy precepts. I hate every false way. Through the word of God I get understanding. You want understanding? Hey, get the word of God. Psalm 119, verse 130. The entrance of thy words give light. The entrance, when you begin to read the word of God, it comes into your heart, it gives you light, it throws the light on. Hey, I don't like to go into a dark house, do you? You like to go in a dark place? Hey, when I go in the house, I want the first thing to be on is the lights. I want to turn the lights on. If I come in this church and it's dark, I want the lights on. I don't want to walk through here with the lights off. Booger my grandma. <laughs> You know, a church is kind of a scary place to be in the night time, ain't it? <laughs> I'm glad for the light. Amen. The entrance of that word gives light. It gives understanding. Again, Psalm 19. I've read this before and went through it with you before, but I want you to get it and look at it. Psalm 19, verse 7 through, uh, come 11. 19, 7, come 11. The law of the Lord is perfect. God's law is perfect. There's nothing wrong with the law of God. It's perfect. Converting the soul. It changes the soul. It converts the soul. The testimony, the testimony of the Lord is sure. It makes wise the simple. That word simple means silly and foolish and ignorant and dumb. Hey, it'll make those people wise. That's simple. I'm glad for the word of God. It gave me, it gave me wisdom. It gave me understanding. And so it'll bless you. It sure will. The statues of the Lord are right. Rejoice in the heart. Some people walk around like a sad sack Sam all the time. You think the mother-in-law's moved in with them. You think they've, uh, you know, been taxed to all their money and all their savings and everything. You think uh, everything's went backwards with them. Why? Because they're not rejoicing in the Lord. That's why. Because the Bible said the statue of the Lord are right. Rejoice in the heart. They'll cause you to rejoice. And then the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. It opens your eyes. It gives you understanding too, don't it? The Bible said the fear of the Lord is clean. It, it endears forever. The fear of the Lord, nothing wrong with the fear of the Lord. The fear of man that brings a snare, the Bible said, but the fear of God is clean and it endears forever. We get to heaven, we're going to still fear him. Brother, we're probably fearing more than we ever feared him down here when we see how big he is, how holy he is, how great he is, how wonderful, how awesome he is. We'll fear him like we've never feared him before. Yes, sir, the judgments of God are true and righteous altogether. His judgments, the word of God is true from beginning to end. Brother, it's true from Revelation. I mean, from Genesis 1, 1 to Revelation 22, 21, it's the word of God. It's true, altogether righteous. More to be desired are they than go. The word of God is more to be desired than go. My brother Dimmer used to go out on the mountains on the Sundays and look for gold. You know, and I told him, I said, Dimmer, you'll find more gold in the house of God than you ever will at on them hills. Forget about looking for that gold, get in the house of God. I'm glad he got right before he died. <laughs> Amen. Yes, sir, there's gold, brother. It's more precious than gold. And it's, uh, it's more to be desired than gold. Yea, than much fine gold. I mean, 24 karat pure gold. I guess that's the highest. I don't know. But anyway, hey, it's more to be desired. The Bible said it's sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. The word of God is sweet. Go to eating the word of God every day, boy, and you'll turn into sugar. <laughs> they asked me if I want sour cream. I said, no, I'm sour enough. You want some lemon? No, I'm sour enough. I want something to sweet me up. Instead of making me more sour, I want something to sweet me up. And you know what will make you sweet? The word of God. It'll take that old bitter spirit away. It'll take that old complaining, belly aching, uh, criticizing, and just told, you know, just being arrogant. Hey, God's people ought to be the sweetest people on God's green earth. You know why? Because they got the Word of God to read. Uh, sweeter than honey, the Bible said. Do you read it? Do you read it? Do you read it? Do you read it? It ought to make you sweet. Amen. Amen. And then the Bible said, More by them is thy servant warned. It warns us about judgment. It warns us about sin. It warns us about time and eternity. It warns us about the coming of the Lord. It warns us about a lot of things. Read it, and it'll make you wise. In keeping of them, there is great 
reward. Hey, in keeping the word of God, there's a great reward. That's why I'm talking about how to get understanding, how to get wisdom. The Bible said in Proverbs 9, 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. The knowledge of the holy. Is he talking about the holy God? Is he talking about holy things? Is he talking about the holy Bible? I think he's talking about it all. Hey, I think when you get a knowledge of the holy things of God, it'll make a difference in your life. When you get a knowledge of the Word of God and find out it's a holy book, it'll make a difference in your life. When you get a knowledge of the holy God of heaven, it'll make a difference in your life. It'll put the fear of God in your life and in your heart. Listen, people don't fear God anymore. Hey, it's a time that we ought to fear Him like we've never feared Him. Then, not only does the Word of God give us wisdom, but the Bible said to pray for wisdom. He, old Solomon, you know what Solomon did? He prayed for wisdom. I don't know exactly how old he was, but he is just a, a, a kid, a young boy, I guess. He may be a teenager. I'm not even sure. And David gave him a charge, and he said, uh, you know, hey, I'm going the way of all the earth, and so uh, you're going to take the throne, and so I want you to, uh, you know, do what's right. Listen to what he prayed in 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse 9 through 12. Well, I'll give you a 9 through 12. You can read it. He, you know, he went and he prayed and he said, God, I'm, I don't know how to go out and how to come in. I'm just a child and this great people. Lord, I, I just don't know. I'm not fit for the job unless you help me. We're not able for the job, are we? That's what I told the Lord and he called me to preach. Well, Lord, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not qualified to preach. I don't know enough to preach. I'm just an old mountain boy, an old farm boy. But I didn't know the difference between the barn door and the front door, amen. But listen to what he said in verse 12. I, this is God talking back to him. I, after he had asked for wisdom to know judgment, to know what's right and what's wrong, he wanted to know what's right and what's wrong. Wouldn't it be a blessing if our politicians would ask God for that? We'd just have a shout spell with them if they'd do that. But listen to what he said in the book of 1 Kings chapter number 3. 3 and verse 12, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart so that there was none before thee like thee. Before thee, there, well, there's nobody before you like that you're going to be. Neither after thee shall any arise and be like unto thee. You know why? Because God said, I'm going to give you wisdom because you didn't ask for riches and honor. You didn't ask for fame. You asked for a wisdom and understanding. He said, I'm going to give you an understanding heart. Ain't nobody going to be wiser than you and have more understanding than you do. And he wrote, what, 3,000 proverbs? And how many songs? 1,000 songs? Wow. I mean, he is so wise. Kings came to talk to him. The queen of the south, she probably the, uh, traveled at least 1,000 miles to come and hear the wisdom of Solomon. God said, there ain't going to be nobody before you nor like, after you like it. There's only one person after him like him, and that's Jesus Christ. He, he was the Son of God. Isn't that something he asked for wisdom? That's what the Bible said in the book of James, chapter 1 and verse 5. If any of you like wisdom, anybody here like any wisdom? Anybody like any wisdom? <laughs> we all do, don't we? If any among you like wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men. How does God give? Liberally. God is a liberal God when it comes to that, isn't he? And upbraideth none. He won't rebuke you. And it shall be given unto you. Let me read it with a little parenthesis in there. If any of you like wisdom, let him ask of God, and it shall be given unto you. If you ask him, he's going to give it to you. What about that? And so ask for wisdom. Well, here are some emphases God puts on things. He says in the book of Proverbs 23, 23, by the truth. You got anything for sale? Yeah, I got the truth for sale. Right there it is. Uh, by the truth and sell it not. When you get a hold of God's eternal truth, don't ever, don't ever, don't ever, don't ever let it go. Get a hold of it. Don't ever sell it. Hang on to it. Amen. Sell it not. Also wisdom. By wisdom. By instruction. By understanding. And don't ever let them go. Hey, hey, y'all still out there? Yes. This is how God views the ungodly. I'm going to get to the message after a while, and you probably won't like it. Just hang on. Don't, get a, don't jump off the boat. If you jump off the boat, you're going to have to swim all the way to shore, and you might not make it. 
best thing to do is just stay on the boat till we dock. Amen. To the last day, amen, is said, and maybe that'll be a blessing to you. It'll be a skinning for some folks, but it'll be a blessing to others. This is how God views the ungodly in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 5, verse 21. Hear now, this foolish people, without understanding, which have eyes to see and they can't see, and they have ears to hear, but they can't hear. Now that's sad, isn't it? He said they're a foolish people. They're without understanding. Again, the Bible says in the book of Romans, this is how God views man. Romans chapter 1, verse 31, the Bible said they were without understanding and without natural affection. Brother, that's bad when you're without understanding and you're without natural affections. People love animals more than they do kids sometimes, don't they? They love things more than they do the things of God and the house of God. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. I'm, only get, I'm almost to the bottom of my introduction now. Hang on. Ephesians 4, 17. The Bible said, Henceforth walk not as other Gentiles who walk in the vanity of their mind. Here's these unbelieving Gentiles. They're walking in the vanity, the emptiness of their mind, having the understanding darkened. Their understanding is darkened. Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. And so God's looking at the Gentile world and he's looking at the heathen world and he's looking at the lost world. Their, their mind is darkened. They don't have any understanding. They don't have any wisdom. And so I come to my message today, I don't understand. There's some things I don't understand. What don't you understand, preacher number one? Why people hate God's word. The holy word of God. Why do people hate the word of God? Some people hate the word of God. And that's a sad day. You know the Bible is the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God. It's the indestructible word of God. It's the infinite word of God. It's the engrafted word of God. It's the insure word of God. And people hate it. It's a sad day. The Bible is the word of life. It's the word of light. And, of course, people don't realize it's a road map to heaven. I gave a Jew a copy of the New, of the New Testament, the Hebrew New Testament. I thought he wanted it. The next time I saw him and he got to talk to me, he said, I threw that Bible away. I said, you threw it away, the, the book of life. You threw it away, the, the road map that leads you to life eternal. Why would anybody throw God's word away? Some one Jew said, hey, you ain't no use giving them that Bible. They'll throw it away. Well, that's, up for, that's them when they stand before God. God said, you had it in your hand and you wouldn't read it. You rejected the light of God Almighty. If you reject the light, you know what you'll get. You'll get the darkness and you'll throw out the devil's lie straight into hell. That's what you do when you reject the word of God. And so people hate the Bible. I don't understand why they hate the Bible. Do you? The Bible said all scripture is inspired by God and is proper for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and righteousness that the man of God may be perfect through the furnished and the all good works. It is what guides you. It's what corrects you. It's what shows you what's right. It shows you what's wrong. Pick it up and read it every day. Get that old King James Bible and read it every day. It'll set your soul to fire. I'll promise you that right now. I don't understand why people hate the Bible, do you? Number two, I don't understand why people don't attend church. Why people don't attend church? The church, the church of the living God is the house of God. It's the place of worship. We come here to worship, right? Now, I know you can worship anywhere uh, that you go. You can worship on the mountain. You can worship in your car. You can worship anywhere as far as that goes. But there's always a designated place to go to worship. The Bible said, not forsaken the assembly of yourself together. And so much the more you see that day approaching. Brother, if you can't see that we're getting closer and closer to coming to the Lord, there's something wrong with your eyesight, your spiritual eyesight, because we're getting close and closer to the coming of the Lord. And so the house of God is a place of worship. It's a place of blessings. Have you ever been blessed at the house of God? Wave at me. If you've, ever, if you've never been blessed in church, raise your hand. Anybody never been blessed in church? Huh? We got one back there, but he didn't understand what I was saying. <laughs> well, everybody been blessed, right? We can all testify. It's a place of blessing. It's a place of learning. You learn about 
God, you say, well, I know everything there is to know. Hey, you're really dumb, ain't you? When you think you know it all, you don't know nothing. Hey, you've never had the experience of all these other saints. You may have had some of the experience they've had, but they've had some things that'll teach you something. It's a blessing we have testimonies, you know, and people stand up and testify what God's done for them, has answered prayer, has healed them, has done other things for them. That's a blessing, isn't it? Hey, that encourages. It's a place of encouragement. It's a place of learning. And so the house of God is a place where the word of God is preached and it's taught and it's a place of fellowship. What a wonderful thing it is to come to the house of God and fellowship with the saints. Hey, you know what it is to be isolated? People's isolated them from the house of God. They've isolated themselves from the fellowship of the saints. What you going to do when you get to heaven? We're going to have to introduce you to everybody when you get to heaven. Now, I know that's not possible, but that's the way you think. Well, you know, people stay out of church so long, they come to church, they say, well, who's all these people here? Right. Well, they forgot about the fact there's been a lot of saints checked that went on to heaven, and you folk come in. Hey, and so I don't understand why people, uh, you know, boycott the house of God, why they don't go to church, and why they don't care anything about the church. I don't understand that, do you? Number three, I don't understand why parents don't take their kids to church. I don't understand why they don't take them to the house of God. You know why? Because I remember going to church. I remember families and uh, taking the family to church. Hey, you know, parents go to church without their kids. When they, they may take them there about, uh, you know, eight or nine or ten, and then the kids, I don't want to go to church. I'm bored up at the house of God. You know why? Because you watch much TV, it bores you at the house of God. It's just boom, 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 boom. That's just the way it is, isn't it? On TV. At the house of God, you got to sit down and let the Word of God penetrate your old, cold, stubborn heart. That's what you got to do. Hey, brother, my kids didn't. Get up on Sunday morning and say, where are we going today, Daddy? They knew where they was going. They was going to the house of God. They didn't uh, walk up to me on Sunday night and say, well, what are we going to do tonight, uh, Dad? What are we going tonight? I said, we're going to the house of God. They knew that where we're going on Wednesday night. We're going to the house of God. Take them kids to church. Keep them in the house of God. You'll be glad that you did one day. Give them a foundation, a good foundation for the time to come. Children are not taking the house of God like they ought to be. You see them out there. And these gangs of, you know, all this stuff are going on. These fellows, these long hairs, and they shake them guitars. You can't hardly hear or understand the word. They're saying they're shaking their heads. It's the one their head don't fly off. It's the one they don't have trouble with their neck, right? Hey, the word of God that was read publicly, and the kids were supposed to be there. Moses, when he was about to leave out of Egypt, he said, Oh, Pharaoh said, leave the kids here. Said, nothing to it. We're taking them kids with us. Right. Take them kids to the house of God as long as they're in your, under your roof. As long as they're in the nest. You take them to the house of God. You teach them what's right. You teach them what's wrong. You don't let them pout and stay home. You bring them to the house of God. Roll them out. They don't let you do that in service. I may have told you about it. I've told a few folks about it. I was listening to this preacher one Saturday. Boy, he has appointed out. And he is talking about being in service. And I wish I could have got a copy of that. I laughed because it was so funny. This old boy, you know, they're supposed to roll out about 3 in the morning. They're going on whatever they call it, you know, marching with that big pack on their back. And this old boy's a-crying. And he went to the captain. He said, Captain, oh, so-and-so, he's cried all night. Said he's kept us awake. Said he's homesick. Why don't you just let him stay in the barracks? He said, I ain't never heard such cussing in my life. Said, he outcussed any sailor I've ever heard. He used words I'd never heard in my life. You tell him to get out of that bed. He's going to march. I don't care how much he's a crying. I don't care how homesick he is. Hey, that's the way you need to get them kids to the house of God, right? Hey, they, you don't need to be a cussing and doing all that stuff, but just roll them out and say, we're going to the house of God. That's where we're going. Because they are your responsibility till they leave the nest, right? They eat your food, they drink your water, they stay in your bed, live in your house. And so you got a right to tell them what to do. Amen. Yeah. If you don't believe that, say, oh, me. Okay, I don't understand why parents don't take their kids to the house of God. They don't, you, you go to church and see. 
But not many of the kids go to church. You say, wait a minute, preacher. Yeah, wait a minute. Old time religion's out. Old time religion's out. But he said, stand and look and seek out the old paths. Where is the good way? Old time religion. You know, there's kids that never have seen the power of God move. They've seen, they went to church and well, they clapped their hands and stomped their feet and leave out happy as they can be. I say that's all right, brother. If they come in a sinner and they leave out a sinner and they're clapping their hands, stomping their seat, feet and having a good time, they're still lost in their sin. Brother, there's something wrong. A sinner, when he comes to the house of God and leaves out, he ought to feel condemned. If he didn't get in that altar and repent, if he didn't repent and get right with God, he needs to leave out of here, boy, loaded down with condemnation and guilt. That's the way it used to be with me. How was it with you? I'd try to hide behind somebody. I said, how's that preacher? He's a preaching right at me. Yeah, he's a preaching right at you because he's preaching the word of God, right? Some kids have never seen the power of God. They've never seen the old, the old Holy Ghost of God move and people shout the house down and weep the way to God Almighty. Oh, friend, I don't understand why parents don't take the kids where the word of God is preached. Don't take them to them refrigerators. You know, some churches, the old saying is you can start a cow back there. Time you got up here, she'd be, be giving popsicles. <laughs> That's pretty cold, isn't it? You say, is any church that cold? You better believe it, brother. There's some of them cold. I've been them some of them services, and I said a sinner wouldn't a bit more get under conviction than man the moon in this church. If that's the kind of preaching they do, nobody would ever get under conviction. You ain't going to get saved unless you get under conviction, friend. Holy Ghost conviction. Oh, I don't understand. I don't understand. Get them kids out of bed. Take them to the house of God. Love them. Pray with them before you put them to bed of a night. Read the word of God to them. Number four, right quick, I got to hurry. Got to hurry. Why? I don't understand why mothers would kill their born, unborn babies. It violates God's holy commandment. Be fruitful and multiply. It violates the law of love. All you mothers, if you didn't, you're different from anybody I've talked to. They say they love that little old baby before ever it's born. Is that true, mamas? Why would you want to kill that little old baby that you love, or you're supposed to love? Do you hate that baby so much? Do you hate it that you want to kill it? That you don't want it to live? It violates the law of love. It violates decency. It stands on the wrong principles. It's my body. I can do as I please with it. Well, let's see if it's your body or not. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you and which you have of God, and you're not your own? You say, well, I'm not saved, preacher. That's not talking about me. Well, you're still your body's a temple of God. For you're bought with a price. What price? Who bought you anyway? Jesus bought you on Calvary. He not only bought you, he created you. For you're bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. God is the one who owns your body. Listen, Romans 14, 7 through 8. For none of us live to himself nor die to himself. No man lives to himself and no man dies to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. Hey, that's not your body. That body belongs to God. He lets you live in that body for a little while. You're just renting that house, so to speak. You don't own that house. If you do, why do you die? Just tell God you don't want to die. I own this house. I want to live forever. He'll laugh at you and say, why, well, you're, you're just uh, dumb as a rock because you don't own that body, right? You'll have to face God at the judgment of them little old babies that you murdered. I can preach all day. You know what? It haunts the conscience too. It haunts 
But the testimony of women that's had abortions, it haunts them. And they think about what that little old baby could have been. Now that little baby, that would it look like me, act like me? Yeah, it's, it's part of you. I want to say number five, I don't understand why women want to go to bed with women. Why does a woman want to go to bed with another woman? I don't understand that. Why does another a man want to go to bed with another man? I ain't never seen a man that I would kiss or go to bed with or have anything to do with when it comes to sex or anything like that. I've never, no, never, no, never seen a man that good looking or that attractive to me. You say, preacher, you're not natural. No, you're the one that's not natural. You sold out to sin. You sold your soul to the devil and you sold out to sin, friend. I'm telling you right now, that's a sad day. You know what? In the Old Testament, women were not even to wear clothes that pertained to a man. What do you think about that? They were not even supposed to wear clothes that made them look like a man. In the New Testament, the men, he said it's a shame for a man to have long hair. And so there's a, the distinction. God put a distinction between a man and a woman. He created male and female, Adam and Eve. And God put a distinction between a man and a woman. And if you can't see that, if you can't understand that, hey, brother, you are in the dark for sure. You're playing the part of a fool. That's what you're doing. I got to hurry. Oh, yes. The Bible says it's abomination before I pass on. The Bible says it's abomination. In the book of Leviticus, he says it's an abomination, 18.22. Leviticus 18.22, it's an abomination. I don't know I gave you that, Michelle. Number seven, I don't understand why anybody would vote for a liberal or a progressive. As I've told you, they're not progressive, they're degressing. Instead of making, going forward, they're going backward, taking us back. They're trying to put us under communism, people. Don't you, don't you see that? Can't you see it's all communistic? Everything they're doing is communistic. Can't you see that 87,000 new IRS people are going to be KGB, secret police? Can't you see they're spying on everybody now? I heard them talking about on one program that they was watching everybody went to church during the pandemic because they're a threat to them. No, brother. Hey, you take the Christians out of America, you got a bunch of, you got a bunch of mess what you got. It'd be a sewer for sure, wouldn't it? Hey, if you vote for somebody that's not a Christian, that's bad. Because, you know, that. well, old Barney and Bernie and Bernie Sanders, he professes to be a socialist, don't he? And people vote for him. Don't they know what a social is? He's communistic in his belief. I'm wondering if uh, he's writing some of the speeches for Biden. <laughs> Sounds to me like it. Amen. You say, preacher, you don't say that thing. You're a preacher. If nobody don't open their mouth, brother, somebody's got to open their mouth. Somebody that's got a light, brother. If the Holy Ghost shows a little light on the path. Hey, a preacher's not dumb if he's full of the Holy Ghost because God shows him things. Amen. I feel God's holy power on that. God said amen to that. Hey, listen. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, chapter 29, verse 2. This Proverbs, chapter 29, verse 2. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. You agree with that? When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice, but when the wicked Bear through the people mourn. What's people doing in America right now? Mourning, mourning. Proverbs 29, 7, the righteous consider the cause of the poor. The righteous consider the cause of the poor, but the wicked regardeth not to know it. They don't care. They don't care how you feel. They don't care about the poor people not having enough money to buy gas to go to work. One fellow, they had him on, he said, I don't even have enough money to to put gas in to get to work. They don't care if you don't have the money to buy groceries. The wicked, they regardeth not when the poor people cry and the poor people have 
Hey, I don't understand why anybody vote for that crowd. I don't understand. In fact, I don't even think it could be a Christian to you. I'll get some calls. On, you'll get some calls on it, brother. <laughs> hey, I told you. Some folks might want to jump off the boat. Don't jump off now. I want to say number eight, and I'm trying to come to a close. I don't understand why people play Russian roulette with their soul. Why would you play Russian roulette with your soul? Now, these probably kids here don't know what that means. That means you take a pistol, and you got, you got a, you know, it's got six shots, nine shots, or whatever, whichever kind of pistol you got. And you put one bullet in that cylinder. You got just one bullet. And you spin that cylinder and you stick it up to your head and pull the trigger. You might be lucky and not be one in that first chamber or even the second chamber, but if you keep a clicking, sometimes it's the first chamber. Bang! Right. The top of their head's blowed off. Why would you want to play Russian roulette with your soul? What do you mean, preacher? You got a soul that's going to live forever and ever. I mean, in your bosom, there's a soul to the spirit that's going to live on and on and on and on. You see, I don't believe that, preacher. You'll soon find out. And hey, you either live on in heaven or hell. It's either heaven or in hell. You have to make the final choice. Man makes the final choice. God will save anybody and everybody that will come to him. The Bible said he won't turn anybody away that comes to him in faith believing. God will save from the guttermost to the uttermost. He'll save anybody and everybody that will trust him, will believe him and repent of their sins. He'll save. God loves to save folks. He went to great lengths to save people. He sent his son, his darling son. How many of you would give your son for the world, the wicked world, the sinful world? How many of you would give your son for a sinful world? But God up in heaven sent his son to this world to bleed and die for you and for me that we could go to heaven. The son of man became the, uh, the son of God became the son of man that the sons of men might become the sons of God. He came down that we could go up. He died that we could live. He became poor that we could become rich. Oh my, my, my. Oh friend, why procrastinate? Procrastination is a thief of time. Procrastination is a thief of time. I'll get saved, preacher, one of these days. I've had a lot of people tell me that. Preacher, I'm going to get saved one of these days. I'm coming to church. I'm going to come to your church. And when I come, I'm going to come. But them same people died never coming. Never having to make a profession. Never ever having given their heart to Christ. Procrastination is the thief of time. It'll take your soul to hell. I want to ask you what's stealing your time. What's stealing your time? What's taking your time away from your soul that you'll spend time making peace with God the Almighty? Are you making peace with God? Charles Finney, who was studying to be a lawyer, and I've given you the story before, but I'll give you a little bit of it. Charles Finney was studying to be a lawyer, and he noticed that they read the Bible, you know, and some of the lawyers use the Bible. I don't even know whether they use it anymore. There's a... They're so far away from God. I don't even know whether they use it or not, but they used to use the Bible. And he said he got him a Bible and started reading. He started going to church, and he got under conviction. And said, one morning he was going to, to the office, the law office, and he was under such deep conviction. He said, I decided to go across the hill over in the woods from town. And then he said, I got on my knees began to pray and he said I heard a twig pop and said I jumped up started to run he said for the first time in my life I recognized the pride of my heart why should I be ashamed of making peace with my creator whom I offended he said I got back on my knees and I cried to the top of my voice asking God's forgiveness and asking God to save me he said, before I realized I was up on my feet, heading back toward town, he said, I began to feel all that condemnation towards it. <laughs> Not knowing too much about the Bible, he said, if I sinned against the Holy Ghost, I don't feel no condemnation now. All that guilt is gone. 
He didn't know what happened to him altogether. He went back to the office at dinner time. All the folk had gone out of the office, had gone to dinner. He picked up the old violin and started to play the religious song. And he said when he did, it was like tides and floods of liquid love that rolled over his soul. God had saved him. You got to take time for your soul. Take time for your soul, friend. That devil steal the time away that you need to take for your soul. Listen to what the Bible said, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to kill, which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And that word hell there means Gehenna, which is the lake of fire. It's not, it's not the hell in the center of the earth, it's the hell in outer darkness. Your soul and your body, beloved, will be in Gehenna, in outer darkness. Your resurrected body and the spirit and the soul that you had while you lived upon this earth will be cast into outer darkness. Don't you think you ought to take time for your soul? Don't you think that the devil's robbing you of the time? Listen to what the Bible said in the book of Mark, chapter 8, and verse 36. What shall a man, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? It's your soul, friend. It's not mama's, it's not daddy's, it's not grandpa's, grandma's, it's not the preacher, not the deacon, not the politician, not the priest, not anybody. It's your soul. It's yours. And you're the one that has to take care of it. What shall a man give in exchange? This is verse 37. This is Mark 8, 37. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? That word, I looked it up, exchange, it means equivalent or ransom. What are you going to give to ransom your soul? Ain't nothing you can give. Jesus done paid the ransom. You've got to receive him as your ransom. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses from all sin. <laughs> oh, friend, why are you hesitating to come to him? Look at the rich man in Luke chapter 12. The Bible said God spake this power about a rich man and he, the Lord blessed his fields and he, it brought forth plenty and he said, what am I going to do? He said, I don't have no room to bestow all my fruits and goods and he said, I know what I'll do. I'll tear these barns down and I'll build greater barns and then I'll say to my soul, eat, drink, and be merry for you got many goods laid up for many days. He thought he had a long time to live. He thought, now, boy, I'm rich and I've got plenty. I don't have to worry about being taken care of me. Listen to what God, God said unto him, Thou fool, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. And then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? See, yes, who, the things you provided for. So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. What about you? Are you a fool? Are you a rich person? toward God or a poor person toward God the time is now come now God never says wait till tomorrow God never says wait till it. you feel like it he always says come now come now today's the day of salvation now is the accepted time come now commit your life to Christ now believe upon Christ now repent of your sins now trust him now I mean don't put it off another time come now that's what the Bible is always saying come now and if you don't come now, I won't understand. But I do understand all them other things because they listen to the devil. They're blinded by the devil. When I said I don't understand, but I do understand. I understand the devil's got them blinded. I understand that the devil's got them wrapped, wrapped up with his will, but he's got them. And uh, they're procrastinating, putting off and thinking these things are unimportant. But your soul is the most important thing you have. Your soul is more important than the money you got in the bank. It's more important than the stocks and bonds you got. It's more important than land or the houses you have. It's more important than anything. It's your soul. You'll have to come to the Lord for him to save it. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I've given you what God gave to me.
I trust that if you're not saved, that you'll give your heart and life to Christ today. Today is the day of salvation tomorrow. You may be in eternity. You can't count on tomorrow. None of us can. We hope we'll be here. We hope and trust we'll be here. But we have to know we've got to be ready when he calls. When he calls, are you ready? Father in heaven, I pray that you touch every heart, every soul. Those that's here in the service and those that will watch and those that will hear, speak to them, dear God. Save every man, every woman, every boy, every girl that's lost. Be glorified, be lifted up, be exalted. We'll praise you for it. In Jesus' name.